My name is Harrison Kleiner. I am an assistant professor of philosophy here at Utah State, and I am a member of the Empowering Teaching Excellence uh, Committee. And so I want to thank you, first of all, for coming, um, and then introduce the presenters today. Uh, Kit Moore is an associate professor of language and literacy in the School of Teaching, Education, and Leadership, where she is also currently serving as director of graduate programs. Kit was an elementary school teacher 15 years before moving to higher education to pursue research focused on accelerating the social and academic progress of English language learners. Her current research use, uses mixed methodologies to explore integrating and stacked research recommended practices in sophisticated ways to support student achievement. That was a mouthful. Kit has been at USU for four years and is actively seeking to better understand and stand and challenge contemporary students and teachers. Our other presenter this morning is Eric Moore, an associate professor of professional practice in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership. For the first 20 years of his career, Eric taught rhetorical and literary analysis to university students. Subsequently, Eric sojourned as a secondary English language arts teacher for 10 years before re-entering higher education but this time to assist secondary pre-service teachers with strategies for strengthening reading and writing practices in all classrooms. Eric has been at USU for the last four years and desires to engage contemporary students and teachers even more effectively. So please welcome our presenters. Well, good morning, everybody. We weren't expecting nearly this number of people, but so it's a delight to see all of you. And we thought we'd be in a much smaller venue. So our apologies if, if all of us feel kind of spread out. So I wanted to start with a, a brief anecdote. For five years in North Texas, I worked with people who wanted to be secondary English language arts teachers. They were in a post-baccalaureate program. They were so eager to make the transition from where they had been professionally to the language arts classroom. They all had BAs in English or a related field, field, that they were hungry for information. They were all Gen Xers, and they handled the interactions with me in a particular way. The uh, interactions were fairly small, in other words, I had four, maybe five, six students at a time, and we'd meet for roughly a semester. Since coming to Utah, my experience with pre-service teachers has now changed. So when, so when I had to share some of the behavioral challenges in the classroom, I had one student tell me, Dr. Moore, please don't take the shine off. I realized I was dealing with a different kind of student. When my, when my wife had her interactions with her students, one person say, nothing but an A is acceptable. She realized she was dealing with a different kind of student. So now this over to Kit. Yes, thank you for being here. So as you can tell from the write-up and the title here, we want to talk about contemporary students. And, and uh, we have been challenged to uh, understand, teach, guide, challenge these students. Of course, our students are uh, preparing to be public classroom teachers, private charter school teachers, um, maybe not the kind of students you're preparing in that sense. But I think we do share this common challenge of understanding our students. Are they the same? Are they different? Are we different? Are we the same? And, uh, reconciling uh, these potential differences. We want to be careful not to stare stereo, certainly. But uh, we will proceed with the discussion from that premise. There are a lot of current resources available. I don't know if I'm supposed to. Um, there are resources out there, I think, on internet or uh, Facebook or whatever. We're seeing on a weekly basis items about millennials or um, uh, new students. And I don't know if you saw today, I saw on the computer that the Beloit College, uh, they're calling it the mindset set list came out today that 
uh, annual list, they say, of students coming into college. This is who they are and what they've experienced. But uh, we'll connect a few of those uh, into the discussion today. So um, we want to share with you uh, an effort this summer to read through a few books and several articles about contemporary students and share with you some idea, ideas uh, from a synthetic perspective. Can we pull some of these resources together uh, from various fields, sociology, anthropology, marketing, economics, and then of course education uh, to integrate, integrate uh, a profile, if you will, and then a way of thinking about what we do in our courses and maybe potential changes that we might want to make just to consider. And you'll see later, our focus will be on the assignments, assignments designed, designed for courses. So, so uh, he has the book, the book over. Uh, um, we want to feature a book that I came across and we've read this summer. Uh, Corey uh, C. Miller and Megan Grace have written a book, as you see there, uh, Generation Z Goes to College. And uh, prior to that, we read a book by Tim Elmore, and uh, the title there is, would you just read that, Eric, because I think there's an interesting contrast. This one, this one is 2010. Generation IYRY are last chance to save their future by Tim Elmore. So the, our last chance to save their future, which I think implies our future as well, uh, was kind of a daunting title. And you might realize that the description of millennials or IYs or the Y generation in some respects was rather negative and has been negative. So I want to point out that C. Miller and Grace's book is really rather positive about the Generation uh, Z. So uh, that, that can encourage us and encouraged me to say, hey, well, maybe we can have a discussion here today about these students. So I just want to preface our discussion, discussion of Generation Z in comparison to IYs, uh, noting that C. Miller and Grace uh, are representative of Gen Xers and a millennial who though have uh, worked extensively with college students. So they have um, served at Arizona State together and then respectively a part in other uh, positions and roles, and roles dealing with freshman students, fraternities, as, as, as um, student service kinds of uh, functions. So they administered a survey and they described their research that, that is the basis of the book. And I just want to acknowledge that it in some ways is severely limited in the number of students who participated. It was essentially 7 percent um, essentially almost 70% women and 70, 76% white, so we acknowledge there are some, some severe limitations, but what they've done in the book is report from, from that study that they've done and then uh, synthesized and um, in, integrate other resources. So we want to acknowledge, to acknowledge that one text is itself one text uh, reporting a study that, study that they, um, interacts with other resource, resources describing this generation. So in front of you, at least I hope in most of you, you can see a multicolored chart. I have the master up here with me. It's an attempt to organize the last six generations here in the United States and to provide comparative criteria that Elmore provides for the first five categories that you see there in green and white. The final column that you see there is uh, Digital Natives as Discussed by C. Miller and Grace in Generation X Goes to College, so that we have some criteria to compare and to discuss. Notice that as you look at the last four, gen four generations, of course, my wife and I are, are members of that first group. Notice that uh, the generations are not even 20 or 25 years anymore the farther we come into the 21st century. century. Many of these terms, boomers, busters, millennials, digital natives, are coming from the popular press, coming from sociology, coming from marketing people. And notice that marketing is a feature, a criterion here on the matrix. 
Notice once again that we are wary about the tendency to stereotype. We don't want to be guilty of that either. But as we move into this matrix, you'll notice in particular uh, the life paradigm, for instance, as we move from Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, notice that there are substantial changes both, both on studies but also based on observation and anecdotes. So notice uh, digital natives, our Gen Z folks, are thinking more and more about making a difference because they've never known a time in which there wasn't economic trouble, in which there wasn't war. Uh, the United States, for instance, has been at war the entire time that they've, they've been alive. So as you think about also, for instance, uh, career, career, notice that their approach to career, the Generation Z folks, want to, to solve problems that exist in our current, current culture. And I think because of their connection to technology in the world, the world. And so notice that view of technology. They want to live it. It, it has been part of their lives 24-7 from, from the bank. Also, as we think about comparing specifically the dominant two groups that most of us work with, the Ys and the Zs, it's, wor it's worth noting, for instance, that as we look at the, um, as we look at the sense of, of uh, parent support, and as we look at education, notice that they have a much more open view of the world than perhaps many of us who might come from earlier generations. So we want to be aware of the fact that technology as an influence, other kinds of influences, have caused expectations in education, therefore, to morph. In the construction of this chart, uh, can I go back? go back? Sorry. Sure. I just wanted to point out that there are some con uh, conflicting notions about these generations, uh, if in fact they're um, valid descriptions. Uh, you might know FOMO, the fear of missing out, that acronym uh, that, is, uh, that is being popular. So this the Gen uh, Z, ten, they want to be interactive, and in part because they've had so much access to information, but then it creates this uh, little bit of an anxiety that I'm missing out, I'm missing something, so I have to have my phone on you know, while I'm sleeping in case something happens. Uh, so the, the columns represent sort of uh, maybe a more positive, more negative um, description of some shared characteristics. And I think you understand what I mean by trophied there, uh, that notion that everybody gets a trophy and everybody gets credit and, uh, for showing up and the kinds of things that we've heard about the millennials. So, so that's a little reference chart, sort of a synopsis of some of the reading that was done uh, through the books and the mater material. So now our task is to see if we can use what is a profile of these stu students to think about the course content we deliver, how we deliver it, and especially the assignments that we design. So here's a, here's a, a brief file. I'll make a few comments on this slide. As uh, Eric said, uh, this, this generation, Generation Z, which was is supposedly born in around 1995 and therefore in college and preparing for the workplace, uh, uh, most diverse generation in, in the U.S. Uh, in fact, that Beloit uh, college listing that came out that I saw today said that for every year they've been alive, there have been a million more Latinos in the American population. So there are just interesting ways to understand the world they've, uh, they're growing up in. Uh, they're eBay babies. eBay started in 1995, so it's strongly associated with this generation. And the notion there is, the understanding is that they have always had an online swap meet kind of mentality. If you've got something to sell, there's a place to... Uh, to put it out there if you want to buy something. So that's why um, marketing and economics has an interest in how uh, they buy, buy, sell. 
It also influences their sort of entrepreneurism that, that, hey, I could start a business, I can put something out, thing out there uh, and see, see, see what happens. Um, they've never had to watch a scheduled TV, TV show. They've always had access to, you know, it, it's there, I can get it whenever I want to. That will come up again uh, in their sense of how they approach assignments. Uh, uh, so they're information curators. They've, they've always been IMAX on the desk. They've always had texting. And one notable um, item about this generation is that they don't like to email. They feel that texting is far superior. They see email as our techno technology, their technology. Uh, they've always had books on audible.com, so they, they can always have books read to them. That's another issue that might come up. Uh, in college coursework. So as Eric mentioned, uh, they've, they have some anxiety, insecurity, worries, because they have grown up with Enron, dot-com bust. You can see there the recession, but also the Sandy Hook um, tragedy. Uh, Pakistan and India have always been nuclear powers. Uh, uh, lives that West Nile has always been in the United States since they were born. Uh, so you can sense you can understand that they've grown up, grown up because in, on the TV, on the internet, they're, they're aware of things, uh, and it's created a certain insecurity or anxiety among these uh, young people. So the other thing that people have mentioned is they have always been exposed to rather horrific uh, war scenes because they've grown up since Saving Private Ryan. They, they've had access and visibility to, to some that previous generations were protected from. So we'll move on now with this profile. So uh, uh, I'm focused on education. Apparently, the Generation Z students with whom we will interact, uh, especially if you're teaching at the undergraduate level, really believe in education. I think that's one thing to be very positive and hopeful about. But they want, they want it very meaningful. They want it to tell them what is needed, what is required for their career options. Uh, it, in that sense, they want it to be personally meaningful and helpful. In, in fact, num num one, um, preferred description of university professors is engaging and compassioned people who facilitate their prep preparation for life. I think we would agree to that. We just have to maybe consider how we, how we embrace that notion, that notion of facilitators of their learning. Um, they are interested in changing their lives, changing the world. There are some conflicting notions with that that we'll talk about. They do want to consider the challenges. Some people, some people, in fact, MTV has named them the founders generation, that they will have half solve some very global, important, and significant problems. And I think in our task is, are we preparing them to be problem solvers of some very, very sticky uh, issues? So they appreciate, I thought this was interesting, standards and accreditation and lists that tell them how they're doing, where they are in the process, what they need to develop as competencies in order to function successfully. And I don't know that we would have said that about some previous generations. That, so, but we put standards in syllabi and, and perhaps checklist, and we want to refer them to what a, um, a professional needs to know and do, and do in their selected um, roles. So at this point we'd like to stop for a moment and have you talk hopefully with someone nearby and the the task here then is for you to consider your course assignments maybe zero in on uh, what do you think is your is your best course assignment what makes it so how does it appeal to contemporary students we know we might have some uh, most mostly Gen Z or Y and Z, but what makes it work, it work for students? Stop and analyze that and perhaps sh share that with the neighbor. The neighbor will take minutes and then come back and, back and look more specifically at assignment construction. Okay, so uh, food for thought then. I know some of you probably have published your courses on Canvas, you're good to go, and you've decided on your assignments, but the next few slides will allow us to just maybe consider ways that we might want to revise 
uh, the work that we have students do. So for Gen Z, here are some considerations you might think about in your assignment build, building. That these students want to believe that, that they can make a difference in the world. And so our assignments might uh, take that, pre that premise that they were asking them to enact change in their own lives and then in the community certainly makes, makes sense. Uh, they appreciate what C. Miller and Grace call head and heart assignments that they care about something that might involve some choice in the topic, topic or efforts that they make to show um, how they're changing, changing the world. Uh, interestingly, though, they like to, they prefer to work alone, apparently. So it's interesting that they're described as the we-centric generation because they've grown, they've grown up under no child left behind, and apparently that's taken hold in their thinking. I noticed this in my classrooms. They don't want anybody to be left out. They want, they want everybody to uh, have a turn. They want to clap and, and, and have a, a bonding experience. But to do some of the work, they don't want to do it with a partner. And it's an interesting conflict, conflict, how you sort that out with your students. But I have learned to never require that they work with a partner. Um, as I said before, they know enough to be fearful, concerned about the world. They have some anxieties. Uh, maybe that relates to what um, Abby was talking about previously. Uh, again, they're motivated by knowing if they're making advancement, they're meeting milestones or benchmarks. They're less interested in uh, being publicly acknowledged or a prize or a reward. It's about this personal ability to make a difference and care for uh, one another. So in the next slide, uh, assignment considerations, you've heard some of this before. You've, you've been coached and encouraged to consider flipping your classrooms. Interesting, uh, uh, interestingly to me is that this generation, their go-to information source is YouTube. YouTube. And Maybe that's, we can use more of that in our assignments. Uh, the caution there is that they need a lot of guidance on how to evaluate the inform information they have ready access to. So I think some of our assignments need to be a little bit more synthetic and we have to give guidance on what's a worthy, trustworthy site. Uh, how do you evaluate that? How, how do you synthesize uh, sources maybe across those, uh, those YouTube videos that they're watching? Uh, they like a jigsaw format, which meaning individuals in a, in a group contribute parts to the, uh, the overall project, but again, they want to do their part by themselves, and uh, we can think about assignments, whether they have assigned roles or selected roles that then contributes to the group rather than expecting them to meet in the library and hash it all out uh, as a team. So uh, this sorting, sifting, synthesizing is something you might, one might want to consider because they are prone, prone to binging. They've been able to watch whole series of televisions you know, and stay up for three days. I call it the Red Bull Syndrome, that uh, they have access to it. When they're interested, they did they could do it. That's converting to their assignments, that they'll wait until they kind of feel it and, and they pump up on something and try to, you know, hammer it out. So the recommendation is that you portion out assignments so that they get this done by such and such and such, and then you get feedback and, re and review and build that because they're not really that organized. Uh, uh, otherwise. They feel that they can get it at the last minute because it's out there on the on YouTube or the internet, and I'm sure many of us of us would have much more processed uh, learning going on. So I'll I'll leave the, leave this here for you, but certainly certainly that you know about that Gen Z considerations might make sense for you. Giving choices, a sense of freedom. Certainly they have they have this. They feel they can get any information at their fingertips that Google reflex. So then what is the task we're having them do? Evaluate, sort, synthesize, integrate information. They want the skills that would help them do what a professional does in that job. We have to think of that end game and back it up perhaps into assignments. Um, 
And the last comment there, you can see they like destiny assignments. Like what, what is my calling and who am I going to be? And I want to reflect and project myself into that future role. That's, an, that's another consideration that might matter for your instruction and your assignments. Uh, we're, we're running out of time. And I was going to show this video. Uh, it may be of interest to you. It's a, an assignment that our niece took on. And it is a public service announcement about how to interact with who may be mentally ill. It's animated, it has music, it has quips. It's an interesting example of the kind of project that students may well feel good about and have the technology skills to platform. So I asked our niece, I said, how long did it take you? She said I worked on it a little bit over five days. And she has a four minute public service announcement as the end product. So it's an interesting example, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> so uh, what's, left, what's left for me is how to bring a can-do spirit into the classroom for people who are looking at life with a different set of lenses than perhaps many of us. So some of the examples that you see here, here include uh, the best one I've tried to use a great deal. I want to help you be the best that you can be, to be the best professional that you can be. So we need this practice, this best practice. We need this other best practice. We need this, this strategy, this other strategy. And that constant spirit of we're trying to make sure you're ready. We want you to go out there and solve these major problems that you would like to solve. So, so that's to the IDEA. What, uh, out of those 12 different objectives, what are some objectives that we might consider specifically for the newer generation? So number three in particular resonates with me. So uh, learning to apply the materials, learning to them to the real world and then looking for real world results seems to be more and more of an expectation of, of young folk, folks that are working with. Notice the, the second item, number nine, learning how to find and use resources for answering questions. This is a good example of helping them make good use of that Google reflex. The desire to go out there and find information is good. How to sift that information seems to be even more important as we're helping them get to solutions for real world problems. So oh. I'll turn this over to Kit. Oh, so I, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot something. Um, one of the things that struck me in the book is that the Generation Z student, this was self reported data when it was. Um, Dis, uh, you know, combined and analyzed, they realized that Gen Z don't see themselves as creative, which I think is interesting if they want to solve problems. And they feel that there are jobs out there on the internet because they could put up some business, some service, and, and do well that way. So they're uh, an interesting group to think that they're that they don't want to work together, but they want to solve, solve problems. And they're not particularly creative, but they want to make a difference. So it's just a, it's an interesting group that we're uh, dealing with. So the last item is uh, whether you have comments about anything that you've heard here and been considering and in a conference like this uh, about changing your assignments to better serve and meet the needs, needs of students with whom we're working. Go ahead. We'd like to hear just a couple comments as the time remains. We have just a few minutes. Oh. 
Thank you for bringing that in because that's, that was an interesting aspect. Um, and I think your angle makes sense that you're, you're changing how they get it and then they do want to change their lives and, and make a difference so I could see the connection. Yes, there was a hand. Jump up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We have students that don't want to work in groups or they don't want to be collaborative, but they're going to have half to be yeah. in the workplace. They want a rubric about something, but I can't send out scout students in the workplace and ask their boss for a rubric about an assignment if it works. How do we teach them to do those things, to work in groups? How do we teach a, a generation that seems disinclined to do that? Yes. I think it is a real, it's a real I know that in the book they talk about, about giving uh, certain roles assigned that then they have to report back to the group because the generation seems to care about not letting others down. So I think you have, you have to uh, blend that together. But it is an interesting sort of conflict. Just to comment on that, not what to do, but maybe not what to do uh, is the part of that. They have to sign up for two tech working groups, so they'll pick his objective working group on group or we're to find information in an objective idea. Yes. Yet the students, if they have provided the instruction in that area, provided feedback directly in that area, greater than that, it's just an auxiliary assignment. They're real not going to really teach me an objective. It's a kiss of death for, for that point. So just a caution, I'm not sure as well. The book does point out, and then some of the other articles that employers are that's probably one of the biggest challenges they will have with this generation the notion of that they don't really want to work together, and yet that's going to be real life. Thank you for your attention. We've been given the sign, and we hope to continue the discussion throughout the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>